Hello, and welcome to Sound and Image Lab. This is the Dolby Institute podcast. It is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Well, you can't get much more technological than the dark and grisly animated anthology series Love, Death, and Robots on Netflix. And I'm really excited today to talk about uh, this show. It, uh, it's part of our ongoing Emmys coverage. And uh, today we're going to talk about the episode Snow in the Desert, which is nominated for Best Sound Editing and Best Short Form Animated Program at the Emmys this year. Today we'll be speaking with sound designer and three-time Emmy winner Craig Hennigan and supervising sound editor and dialogue editor and four-time Emmy winner Brad North. Uh, If you've listened to our show previously and in the past, you might uh, recognize Craig. He is making his fourth appearance on our podcast today. He was in episode 26 talking with Darren Aronofsky. Uh, Darren was on the show and talked with Craig uh, about their longtime collaboration that goes all the way back to Requiem for a Dream. Craig was also in episode 46 talking about his work on Roma and on episode 50 talking about Stranger Things. So it's uh, always a pleasure to have Craig on the show to talk about sound. So let's have a listen to how Brad and Craig crafted the sound for this episode and a little bit of a warning if you haven't seen it yet it's only 18 minutes go on over to Netflix and check it out but it is incredibly violent uh, especially for an animated show so let's dive in and talk about this uh, very special episode of this animated series. Craig, Brad, thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast and and talking to us today about Love, Death and Robots for which you guys are uh, uh, have a well-deserved Emmy nomination. Um, so, Brad, you're the sound supervisor uh, for the entire uh, for the series, um, and uh, obviously, it's an anthology series. So, th- that gives you some opportunities to really uh, explore a lot of different kind of styles, and there's a lot of different kinds of of things going on um, in in the entire series. Obviously, you brought Craig in uh, to do some sound design on this particular episode. How do you two work together, uh, and how do you how do you figure out like Oh, I think I, I think I want to bring Craig in on this one. Yeah. Um, well, Craig and I have been working together for, I don't know, three or four years now. Um, and to be honest with you, when I'm watching these things down, I'm thinking about who who can help out on this one. You know, whether it's Craig or Harry or, or some of the other guys, or sometimes I'll do it myself. I did that quite a bit in, in season one. Um yeah, I, I don't know. I just kind of keep it in mind of because I've been working with Craig for a while. I've been working with Harry for a long time and some of these other guys. So I don't know. Sometimes it just fits and sometimes, you know, they can do a pass and then I'll do the rest of it. it you know, it's just kind of like you said, it's an anthology. They all come with their own things. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it seems like a lot of the the 3D uh, photo reel mocap you know, the, the big stuff, um, I'll get Harry or Craig to, to do those. Um, and I mean, it's, it's worked out. <laughs> the, those guys do a, do a great job. So, um, yeah, but it's an anthology. It's, it's fun. It's, that's kind of part of the fun of the show is that, um, you know, you get to do tons of different things with tons of different peoples with, uh, tons of different styles and, um, yeah, it's just creatively, it's it's a fun sandbox to play in. Without a doubt. So our, our friends at Netflix uh, have been really gracious to provide us <clears throat> a couple of um, scenes to take a look at and discuss. So let's take a look at this first one. This is from the opening of the show. Um, our character, our main, our main man, Snow, uh, this is when we meet Snow. He arrives at this kind of um, dystopian town on this desert planet. Um, and he, uh, uh, goes into town and, and, and picks up, uh, picks up a special delivery, uh, that he's been, uh, anticipating. So let's, let's take a look at this clip.
Did they come in? Oh, it's getting harder and harder to bring the real stuff in from Earth. It's getting expensive. Maybe I could interest you into some synthetic analogs. Maybe you should shut the fuck up and give me my stuff. Order another two kilos, I'll be back in a month. So, you know, obviously this is from the very beginning of the show. I always love kind of talking about these opening sequences because this is when you like you establish the rules of the world and you kind of explain kind of what this space is and talk about your approach to building um, the sonics for this first, the, the, the acoustic environment for this first, this opening sequence. Yeah, I mean, look, that opening shot's an iconic sort of, you know, riff on an iconic shot, right? And And so sonically, we just wanted to make it like, you're you're you run into this world of heat and desert and it's a little you know it's obviously got tinges of blade runner it's got tinges of other cyberpunk or steampunk sort of feeling to it so our thing you know and some what of a prehistoric vibe to it in terms of the you know the, the vulture looking creatures um that are flying around so really it was about finding some, some, you know, lack of better description, some winds and some tonal winds and some sort of zombie winds and sort of like spooky winds, if you want to use those sort of type of words of descriptive nature, uh, to sort of set up the sort of uh, first opening feeling of it, right? And then contrasting that with going into sort of the, the sort of, you know, cyber village, you know, before he gets to the bar, he walks through to get, you know, to get his little package there and it's kind of... It's kind of this sort of like, you know, flea market, sort of, you know, steampunk flea market, so to speak. And then, you know, so we did a lot of cool sounds in that thing. I did a lot of ambient mechanical and clanging and reverb type metal stuff. And then Brad, Brad sort of came up with some different crowd languages that he can sort of speak to um, that just sort of set up this whole like world of like, you know, there's not a lot of dialogue initially. Right. So you're just sort of like trying to take it all in. So that was kind of that was kind of the, the beginning of it. and and a lot of it is just trying to keep up with the visuals, like in terms of, you know, if it's an awesome visual, you want the sound to be this kind of a cool sound, you know, and, and kind of a, you know, an edgy or, or, you know, just something that's got some sort of texture to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up or, you, you know, you, you mentioned just keeping up with the visuals, you know, uh, you know, it's animated, but to call it photorealistic, I think doesn't even really do it justice. Like this is, is this is it's, it's, it's hyper amazing. detailed, super finessed animation. Obviously that gives you guys, hands you guys a challenge to like, the sounds gotta, 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 you know, step up. And uh, they gotta pop, they gotta step up. They gotta have color to it. They gotta have depth. They gotta have, you know, all these things. And that's, I think what Brad and I always go into all these little, um, the love death and robots animated things is dynamics and contrast and using using sounds and then taking everything out and this is a perfect example this episode has a lot of that dynamic of of heavy and then quiet and setting up different things you know and and that's something that visually is there and when it's there visually that just allows us sonically to be able to really latch on to it you know i think one of the things that works out really well that that craig hit perfectly was you know trying to sell the dryness of it too um you know the the the, the dry winds you can hear the sand and, and lots of rocks and stuff like that so that was good to establish um and then once we get to the flea market again kind of a an iconic type of thing going through this this market on a different planet and um you know craig filled it up with lots of fun stuff and uh yeah, we actually were able to do loop group on this one. And uh, yeah, we, we kind of made up some different languages and stuff like a la Star Wars or something like that. Because it does have a bit of a Star Wars-y sort of vibe too. It has a kind of like a, it, it kind of has a Moss Eisley feel to it, right? This right. particular, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So so we did some, you know, lots of wild track of, of just kind of gibberish and, and kind of found some of the, the cooler, interesting stuff. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to try to do something cool with with the with the guy who was uh, selling them the the strawberries, and we 
was messing around with it and it was just going too much. And honestly, what, what worked out was not really treating his voice, but actually just putting him in the picture. Like, like you said, following what the visuals are doing. So he's sitting behind glass. We've got this like steampunky sort of speaker going through it. That did all the heavy lifting as far as like making it cool and sci-fi. It wasn't making his voice all strange. It was actually the, the just setting him in, in the picture was, was interesting enough. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, like you said, it's, it's kind of establishing, uh, textures and, and following the visuals and stuff. And yeah, I mean, as far as the photorealistic stuff is concerned, you know, it just, it, it's, we need to follow suit. We need to find those details and, and hit them. You know, we can't do real general stuff. We have to make it super, super detailed because the picture is super detailed. And, you know, we, we've all seen this picture, great picture, somehow it does something with your ear too. And, and it makes it richer sound wise to, to see something like that and to be able to hear it. Uh, the visuals help a ton too. So it, it's definitely a, a handshake sort of thing between sound and visuals. It's really true. You said that it just reminded me like back in the old days when we used to, you know, we used to, you know, mix a movie and then Craig, you probably remember this, like at the, at the end of the process, you'd get an, you'd get actually the get, color an, corrected. You'd, you'd get an answer print, right. And you'd yeah. see the final color corrected movie. And suddenly the, the whole thing sounded much better too. Right. All the stuff that you stressed about, you know, like that I would like, ah, oh, anguish, that's not quite the right sound or whatever. Then you watch it. You're like, Oh yeah great it works but what am i what am i keeping staying up at night for and stuff for sure it's uh and yeah but a lot of that is i mean obviously you know i think people forget because it does sit so naturally that you know animation you know you got the voices but you got you you guys are responsible for everything else right except voice well obviously you're right with no production with no production track yeah i mean it's literally from the ground up which is why animation is so fun right and and, and especially things like this that you know it's the world is your sort of oyster to a certain degree right you can you know you obviously you got to follow visuals and you got to sort of follow story which is always ultimately story is the biggest point of it all but within that framework there is you know tons and tons of opportunities for for sonic details and little things and stuff that you might not even hear on the first watch but if you watch it the next time through you know and and the voice i mean the voice that brad brad was talking about um I think that's awesome because I always like creatures because us sound designers want to do that. Oh, I got to make this guy's voice all screwed up and messed up. And then no one could understand, no one could, cause he's an alien and no one could understand him. And then it's inevitably like you send it back to them and they're like, we can't understand what he's saying. Yeah, but it sounds rad. No, doesn't it? You know? So I really like shows that actually just put, you know what, we're going to own it. This guy's voice is like, we're going to put him in the space. We're going to do this to him, but we're not going to over, we're not trying to over sonically, you know, it's, you know what I mean? Like, is that sort of like when to do that and when not to do that is, is an art in itself. And so I always appreciate that with Brad because he's like, takes a step back. And he's like, yeah, we could have went down that road and he might've, he might've explored some of that, you know? Um, it wasn't from a lack of trying, you know, I tried a bunch of different things and found some cool stuff, but you know, it just doesn't fit. Sometimes it's like Craig said earlier, you just kind of have to trust yourself and um, yeah, it just like making it all warbly and gurbly and sound, making him sound like a crazy creature. It didn't, it didn't fit. It didn't fit the guy's personality. It didn't fit what you were seeing. It didn't fit the, so you just kind of put him in the space. There was a little bit of something on it, but not much. Um, and it's just more, you just put him in the space and it, it worked. Yeah, no, it, it definitely did. So, uh, shortly after that particular scene, we end up, uh, we end up in the bar and, uh, and we find out some interesting things about snow. He is, he's, um, he's wanted, shall we say he's a very popular. He's a very popular man, our snow. Yeah. So he's, <laughs> he's yeah. like you, Glenn. Oh, he's like you, Glenn. That. So he's, a, he's accosted by these bounty hunters. There's a fight. He loses a hand. Let's take a look at this clip. I said, I challenge you. Everyone here heard it. That puts me within my rights. So stand up.
I mean you no know, harm, unless harm is meant. So uh, one of the things I love about this is I think I kind of got lulled into like, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's animated. This is, uh, you know, this is going to be, I, I wasn't expecting it to be quite as graphic and violent as it is, you know, when I realized, <laughs> oh my God, they shot his hand off. He really gets, he really, Snow really gets the shit kicked out of him in this, in this episode. Um, talk to me about, uh, about this particular sequence and, and the approach to putting it together. One thing that's great about this was the animation and the performances from the, from the actors, the, uh, the first bounty hunter, she's so great, like just expressive. And, and the way that the mocap and the animators were able to, to catch all the features and the way that she delivers it, she's great. So like, again, sometimes the stuff's in good shape when it's handed off to us. So um, you know, that, that helps. Um, and yeah, we just wanted it to sound like, uh, to the setting needs to sound, you know, like earlier on kind of gritty, kind of dirty, make it sound like a different world. So, um, so yeah, I mean, just establishing the, 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 the feel of the bar and then, just the performances from from the actors were just so great, and then as far as all the uh, the crazy <laughs> huge shots and and sound design, I'll let uh, Craig get into that. Oh yeah, I mean that, it's just the OK Corral, right? It's the showdown, you know, and uh, you can't bring a gun to a gunfight. You got to bring a cannon, you know, and and that sort of that sort of that's the sort of aesthetic for for Love, Death, and Robots, especially these ones, right? You know, and and uh, you know, so it's really fun putting those kind of weapons together because it's a lot of mechanics, and it's a lot of thinking about other sounds. Yeah, I mean, could I just have used gunshots and so? Like, but there's like cannons and there's explosions and there's grenades. There's other things going on there. Really percussive kick drum hits. There's other sounds and then the the timing the, the important thing is is snow's gun versus the bat the big you know the big guy's gun versus the, the girl's gun the gore all those sort of things have to read and the action's so quick it's not about making it really rhythmical and staccato you know and really sort of to the point and that was kind of that's kind of the fun challenges because you want you want things to be big and fat but they don't have a lot of time to live you know in in their in their world so um, so that's where sort of percussion, percussion comes in and, and, uh, you know, we, we have to be mindful of where these episodes play, right. In terms of sonics and frequencies and stuff like that. So I want to make them as big and fat as possible, but I can't depend on a subwoofer all the time. Right. So I got to look at sort of low end. I got to look at low end more in the mid range or the upper lows kind of ideas and stuff and, and sort of layering tracks to sort of give you that feeling when you're watching it on headphones or on a laptop or, or other things. And that's, that's where you just got to kind of design sounds that sort of like fit the character, fit what you're looking at, but also have all these different frequencies to, to sort of like come across all the different devices that people are watching these shows on, which is a challenge, you know, it's a challenge for, for everything nowadays, but, but definitely it's a challenge in these, in these episodes because you want, you want the same feeling out of, you want to be able to squeeze every single last little, frequency you know for everybody watching it not just on a on a big home system or well but to your point you can't just kind of you can't just kind of work for the lowest common denominator also because the the visuals are so stunning and yeah. i you know I, I was able to watch this in dolby vision and it it it, it looks oh, spectacular it's, it's, it's right? rad so you you, yeah. Yeah. you have to yeah. you have to also kind of give it the cinematic treatment oh yeah yeah, I mean, I think I think that's just an aesthetic that I think you know. That's in as a sound designer, that just has to be in your 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 wheelhouse, right? Like, I, I never even when I started, I didn't even think about that sort of term. Um, I worked on a lot more film than I do, quote unquote, television or, or whatever. But I never, I never, I don't think about the piece that I'm working on, or the project I'm working on, if it's TV or or film in that sensibility. I always think about it as a cinematic thing. I always think about it to be the biggest and best that it can kind of be, you know? Um, but it's there visually, like you said, it's all there, you know? And when it's all there, it's much easier. It's easier to sort of get the cool sounds. <laughs> it's a pretty matter of fact, you know, it's like, 
cool weapons can equal cool sounds. Pretty, yeah. it's pretty simple. But I'm sure know? at the same time, you also kind of have to think about pacing yourself because you know you got an even bigger action sequence coming, right? <laughs> so like, right. You can't, right. you can't, uh, you right. can't, you know, put all your chips on the table at this no. point. No. Well, but, but again, story wise and visually, it's fast, right? It's a quick, it's a quick one. It doesn't, you don't, you don't get to blow your whole load because it is actually so quick. So you, I actually just had a little taste of, some of the bigger weapons, right? Knowing that we're going to get into sort of more of the gore and more of the sort of, and then the fact that they're in sort of a valley esque type things with a lot of mountains and a lot of hills around and stuff and rocks around, you're going to be able to play with echo and you're going to be able to play with decay and reverbs and stuff. So it was kind of like making the bar tight and, and then opening it up you know, a little bit more down the road in the ambush yeah. sort of sequence. So before we, before we uh, take a look at that ambush sequence, um, Brad, you mentioned uh, mocap. So I know that this wasn't kind of like the, the classic Disney or Pixar style of animation where the actors come into like an ADR booth and record their line. So t- just in terms of, uh, so this was a situation where the, uh, was the entire show done captured with motion capture. So that means the actors are coming into some sort of volume and their, so are, and their vocal performances are being captured while they're just walking yes. through that process and what, what came to you? Yeah. So, um, a lot of it is, is sync dialogue that was shot when they were doing the, uh, the mocap. Um, they're, they're able to, to record audio while they're doing it. Usually, um, when they have the, the whole face rig, um, they can have a mic on it. They'll even have a boom sometimes if there's, if there's a need for it. Um, so a lot of times they, that's the sound for that take. Now, granted, there is some classic ADR, you know, sometimes they don't like a read or something. So they'll bring them into to the studio and, and redo it. So, um, and they actually will, will revoice some of these characters too. Um, there, there's a revoice person in this, in this episode. So I would say, I don't know, maybe three times out of four, it's, it's the sync dialogue and, uh, it should match, uh, exactly what they shot on the day. Um, so, but they do swap it out sometimes. Yeah. They'll swap it out for different takes or they'll, they'll, uh, they'll bring them in later or they'll revoice it. So it's, it's kind of all the above. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, um, how you guys use Dolby Atmos or how you how you prepped for for Atmos on this show. Oh well, I mean, I cut I cut in Atmos all the time. So my 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 rig here at home, I have a seven dot one dot four rig, um, and uh, you know I have the Dolby Atmos home, you know thing, and I can pan everything to my heart's content. So I do. Um, there's not a lot of time mix wise on these, you know, and, and, uh, you know, Chris and Joe who, who mix, you know, mix the episodes, they don't have a ton of time and I want them to be thinking about create creative choices. Uh, I don't really want them to be thinking about panning every single thing. If I can take care of it. Um, you know, I, I mix myself as well. So I, I feel between Chris and I who mixes effects, um, you know, we have a pretty good, you know, handshake deal and, and, uh, I don't put him in corners or back him into a corner too much in terms of he can always unwind something if he wants. I tend to stay away from reverbs. Um, what I tend to do is a lot of panning and a lot of, I'll, I'll do some subwoofer stuff as well, but everything else is sort of and some, a little bit of general EQ, but I, I generally have a template that just allows me to get it to sort of the pre premix, I guess, or, or sort of a quasi premix, you know, but Atmos is like, it's wild, man. It's, you know, I've done it a long time now and, and it's just, you know, it's just what it is for me. I, I don't think of sound any other way. It just becomes an extra component of what I can do. And, you know, a project like this, it just opens up to, you know, all sorts of different things from atmospheric things, specifically atmospheric things in the opening scenes with the wind and to try to sneak sounds in because, you know, we got to be cognizant of music and where, where music is sitting. So it's like, you know, sometimes you got to run for the hills. You got to run for the objects. You got to run for the other spots of of the sonic stage that you're working on. You know, um, but it, it really, I start from the ground up in Atmos, and I start to build, and I'm sort of mixing and editing, sort of at the same time, so I sort of know where things are gonna 
are going to be. And then I think Joe and, and Chris just sort of take it to the next level once they get the music in and once they sort of, you know, see, you know, and it's always great to sort of, you know, hear episodes like this done in Atmos, you know, because it just adds again, it adds another layer that not everybody gets obviously when they're listening to it on their, you know, on a television or on an iPhone or a laptop or something. And uh, it's awesome that Netflix supports Atmos. It's awesome that more and more people are, are doing it. I wish we could get more time to mix in Atmos. I feel like our budgets don't always reflect the amount of work that us sound folk have to put into things. Um, but it's rad. You know, you know, I've always been a big supporter since day one. The first thing I did, you know, in 2013, I think it's been, I try to do everything I do if I can through Atmos. Yeah. Sure. Well, and to your, to your point, yeah. it's, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, you guys are doing the sound editorial and then you hand it, you hand it off to mixers, but to your point, like that, that firewall is not really a firewall anymore. And uh, a lot more, no, yeah, a lot more of those mixing Things that we used to think of mixing are becoming part of the editorial process. Yeah. 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 I mean, you have to have a room. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't necessarily like, you know, people trying to do things in, in smaller rooms and, and trying to get, I mean, you're, you got to kind of do what you got to do. I mean, if that's the situation you're in, you got to sort of go forth. I, you know, I'm fortunate that I've built a little room here that translates pretty well. And, and I have enough experience. I feel like I'm going to send it to Chris and it's really close already. And it's not going to be like him scrambling to sort of like figure stuff out. Um, but it's it. There is no wall anymore. There hasn't been for a long time in my mind. It really hasn't, you know. And and uh, there's. But I love mixing on big stages. It ha, it it it's it's paramount to sort of do mixes in Atmos on on a on a bigger in a bigger theater in a bigger stage. It's just you're just not going to get it as clean as focused as detailed. Any any pick any again pick what you want to say about it. That that is part of the process that you know, is, is as important now more than ever, you know, even though we are doing so much work in smaller spaces, the philosophy still has to be like, you're doing that work there so that you can actually be really creative and really, you know, go for it in, in the bigger space. Uh, Brad, uh, Craig, uh, uh, mentioned the music. I, I would call this a pretty score forward, uh, piece in, in, in specific parts. And the, the music is pretty big. Uh, did you have access to the music track or at least a rough version of it while you were building, uh, the, while you were sound editing or was that kind of like a, was that an element that came in at the last minute on the mixing stage? No, usually the, uh, it's pretty close. Um, our composer, Rob Carnes did it. Uh, he does a good job, uh, getting ahead of everything. Um, all the stuff that when we get the picture and get the, uh, the, the guide tracks, usually the music is, is pretty close. And then, then we'll get the stems and stuff later, uh, for the mix. Um, but the music's in pretty good shape it, and, uh, he, yeah, Rob does a good job. Um, it's probably a really difficult thing for him too, to do so many different styles on this show. Um, but he, he really does a great job and, uh, yeah, speaking of uh, mixing in Atmos, one of the things is uh, mixing the music and, and peeling it off the off the the screen a little bit. So Joe DeAngelis, our our dialogue and music mixer, you know, he likes to pull some of that stuff back, and Atmos helps that as well. You know, it's not it's not just the fun gimmicky type of stuff where you get to pan a you know an airplane or a jet over or you know or have like a PA on top. I mean, that's all fun stuff, but I would say for the most part, um, mixing an Atmos is, is more bringing the atmospheres kind of back, pulling the, uh, the music back just a little off the screen. And it actually works out pretty well in the fold down on the two track. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, before we take a look at this last sequence, which is the big kind of, uh, shootout confrontation, the ambush in the desert, um, there were a couple of sequences that really popped out at me that I wanted to ask you about just from a, a sound design and, and editorial perspective. Uh, I love, I love that kind of, um, the narrative thing that gets set up, like they don't travel during the daytime because it's too hot on this planet. So they kind of hunkered down and snow has what he calls a day tent, which I, I love the sound of the day tent. Can you talk a little bit about sort of figuring that out and, and making that, making that work? 
it's a leather coat. <laughs> it's just a leather coat. It was so it was so I mean, it was so well, soothing sure, and calming, I'm, right? I, I'm sure. Oh, oh, yeah, you mean yeah, inside. Yeah. Oh, I thought you meant when it full when it actually oh, when okay, it right, forms. Right, right. Uh, you know, sorry, and Brad, I mean, I'm sure Foley probably added a few things too, but. Oh, inside. Yeah. No, it, I mean, that's just the, the contrast of dynamics. Like outside, you're going to make it heavy and, and like, you know, wind is beating and sort of low end rumbly wind. So that when you go in and that he turns the little thing in the steam, you know, the little steam or, uh, you know, it's just like, that's just contrast. And, and uh, you know, I think I did a version where you heard some of the buffeting outside, but the guys wisely took that stuff out because musically what it was doing and just story-wise the sensuality between the two of them and just making it sort of a little dome of silence essentially right you know so um craig you're right uh it was more playing the intimacy and just playing what was kind of around you um plus one thing that works really well on this episode is uh the dynamics which you know we benefited from in sound but you know, there's a nice arc of going up and down and up and down. So, you know, we have a big shootout and then we come down and then we've got, you know, a big sequence and then we come down. So um, usually if stories, you know, have that up and down, then we can we can follow suit and make it dynamic and, and play the hot's hot and the cold's cold. Um, so, so, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why it works. Not only was it just the great sounds, like I agree with you, that that little air conditioning thing i don't know what it is but it, it does sound soothing you're right it's it's crazy um but it's it's also the the story and it's coming down and then it's playing the intimacy with just them so you know again it, we're we're following the what the picture's doing because it, it's it's really great the pacing of it's really great so we we benefit from that I mean, it's a mysterious he's like a mysterious character right you know and sort of playing into the you know, and obviously even how they do it visually, where when, when we're inside the tent, it's blues and it's dark, it's, it's cooler tones and stuff. So, and you don't quite know what's going on. She's trying to figure out what this guy's all about. Uh, he's kind of a quiet dude, right? So it's just, you know, it's all those things together sort of make up a nice mellow day tent <laughs> adventure. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned intimacy right. and uh, I think, you know, uh, Craig, you brought up Foley. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't remember, uh, maybe since the days of Ralph Bakshi, uh, seeing like love making in animation before your, your, wow. your Foley team must've had a lot of fun with that, uh, with, with that sequence. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Don and, uh, Alicia are, are Foley, uh, are Foley ladies. Um, no, they do an amazing job. Um, they're, they're really into detail, not only just selecting, the right feet and the right props and, but, and performing, but it's, it's, it's getting into the real details. So, you know, it's like you said earlier on in, in animation, you got to start from, from, uh, nothing. So, so, uh, they do a great job filling out the track. So, yeah, let's take a look at this last sequence. This is, um, uh, this is the, the big fight, the climactic fight in the desert, uh, snow again, gets the, shit kicked out of him <laughs> <laughs> it's, it should be it's called shit shit in the desert snow instead of snow in the desert, you get the shit kicked out but of there's some time. good reversals that he takes the big guy down and you know it's a it's a, it's a good yeah. it's a good fight sequence and then obviously there's the big reveal which is that uh our, our female character um is is revealed as a as a cyborg so let's take a look at, at this uh, at this sequence daddy Baby! Who was that? Fuck, kill Jarrell. He's coming your way. your sack. I'm going to take my time cutting on the rest.
It makes no sense, Snow. You've been alive for centuries. And yet you choose to live here, on this backwater shithole of a planet. But now you'll die here. So, Craig, you mentioned on the uh, when we were talking about the earlier sequence, like how uh, how mechanical the guns are, and I really enjoyed that. This is not like a this is not like a kind of a Star Wars laser pew pew sort of uh, approach to the to the weaponry. So, can you talk a bit about like how you how you built um, built the weaponry in this in this particular sequence? Yeah, for sure. It's it's definitely leaning toward. I mean, you know, the t the term steampunk is probably overused a little bit, or future weapon, or or, or whatever. Um, it's really nowadays. It's sort of a you know, it's looking at what the animation is doing, um, looking at sort of the world that we've built. It's obviously that sort of cyber mechanical type world. I like retro things. I like stuff from sort of the, you know, the industrial age. Um, so I'm always looking for rhythmical sort of sounds that kind of can build, um, that I can use in, in sort of sequences. And uh, so, you know, these guns were very much that world. They were, if they were regular guns, they were like, you know, for the gun cocking and stuff, there were old Winchesters that I've sort of manipulated a certain way or something like that, you know? Um, and then a rhythmical, you know, the, there's one or two shots of, of the one, the one bad guy sort of like, it's literally a machine gun. So I'm, I'm thinking it more like when you look at the streamers and the ricochets, it kind of looks like an old gangster movie a little bit. Right. So you look, I'm looking at sort of like, Oh, well, what, what from the Tommy gun world or the worlds of the sort of like mobsters can I take and sort of manipulate a certain way. Um, there are laser shots in there. There are those sort of sounds. There are manipulated ricochets. There's are, there are reverse things. It's sort of a, you know, it's sort of a composite of all those sort of things. Um, but it just needed to really rip. It needed to sort of like be that mid range had a lot of low end, but it, it had a real mid range to it for that guy. So that the bigger guns, which are the single shots can be contrasted to like just really big percussive sort of single boomers, you know? Um, and then the final thing, you know, the one guy, you know, I think there's the one, the final body, who's like just going around and popping everybody, right? He, he's like single shot that just needed to have a super awesome sound strength, a little bit of echo on it. Um, and then just sort of that, again, that, that sort of Western sort of feel of, of uh, you got him, you know, he's the bad guy, but you want to make his gun sound like, Whoa, what, what's up with that? So it's got that, you know, it's, it's just got that mechanical sort of feel to it. Just if only just to make them cooler sounding, you know, you know, and just sort of like, you know, and there's, there's so many episodes and so many things out there in the world nowadays, right. You know, of, of like these sort of types of animated projects or film projects. And it's always, you always got to try to find your world, right. You always got to try to find it. And, you know, so many shows out there are sound so amazing. And you're like, Oh my God, like, you know, 15 years ago or whatever, you'd go see a movie and it's like, ah, it didn't sound that great. But you go see movies nowadays, every movie sounds amazing, right? You know, and every TV show sounds amazing. The bar gets set every, you know, so what you start looking for, sound designers, are little detail things that sort of can set your things apart. And that's kind of what, what you know, that ambush is all about. It's making, looking at the different weapons, where they are in the story, what's the story that weapon particularly needs to sell and then sort of going with it from that that perspective that's really interesting that's yeah, really well put i and and obviously you know when we all started off in the industry there was a big there was a big difference between cinema versus television oh i mean i mean how much how many times did you hear people i don't want to work on tv i don't want to you know and and it's just like what what you know and and having that attitude is kind of completely dismissive right you know but you know, I mean, and maybe it was it was just for a long time, but then you know when the wire started showing up, or Oz, or some of those early HBO shows, you know, and you're like, wait a minute, something's going on here with writing, 
that's like, you know, and then cut to now and you're looking at some of the best things are on Netflix, you know, that, that are, you know, and they have, you know, and then, but they have eight or nine episodes to tell it. And then you got something like Love, Death and Robots, which is like an anthology of completely different types of stories, but they're done so well. Each, each one is done so well and to such a high level. It's amazing. It's kind of, you know, I remember Tim Miller, uh, talking about it he's like do you remember heavy metal magazine do you remember that that right that's how when he was when he was sort of talking about this you know this anthology thing he was doing that was one of the references was like how wild would it be when you'd open that magazine and it was like completely different weirdo stories right you know that's that's always been a that's always been sort of a touchstone for you know and those those magazines and books were very very visually you know you mentioned Ralph Bakshi I was a huge Bakshi fan, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I mean, God, like just that stuff comes back because it's in the DNA. I feel of love, death and robots, those sort of, that sort of stuff, you know, with the dialogue, you know, we, we played the space just the same way as, as Craig described, you know, it's, it's an interesting space to play with. So, you know, it's, it's nice to hear some slap in the Valley, um, you know, if someone's projecting, you can play that, that color a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the crazy big sounds that, that Craig makes and, and playing it in the space. It, you know, sometimes that stuff doesn't have to get overthought, you know, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's a futuristic gunfight in a, in a valley, you know, that that's gonna sound cool. <laughs> You know, it, it lends itself to, to sounding cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the guns in that, that sequence. Yeah. They're, they're crazy. I like the detail of, of the, uh, the clickities, you know, I, I know, you know, the, the, the steampunky thing plays, plays well there. And then you also have just the massive, uh, cannon laser type of stuff inside of other rifle stuff. So, I, I mean, I thought the gunshots were great. Um, yeah, it's a fun sequence. And the gore. And, and, and gore, gore, lots of gore. Um, it's pretty awesome. So gore, we right? actually had to take some of that out, which was surprising. Uh, cause usually we lean into it, but there was a lot. <laughs> I kind of went, I kind of went for it too. I was like, cause the guys kind of, you get into it when the guns get big and everything gets big. You're like, ah, oh, now I gotta, okay, let's go for the gore. Especially the last, you know, the, her hand. Oh, that was it. all the, and, uh, everything, everything yeah, you cut was in there. You know, no doubt. It's, it's awesome. Um, but yeah, yeah, there was some other stuff that we had to tone down a little bit. So that's the, that's the, that's the moment when she gets, when she gets revealed as a, as a cyborg, did you guys, yeah. did you guys do anything specific with her in that moment and kind of tra change the acoustic treatment of her? Because now we understand that she's a robot. Yeah. The music changes, um, you know, it becomes the high stringy sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, music took the lead on all that. Um, we, we didn't do any tricks. We didn't do anything to her voice. We didn't, you know, nothing like that. It was letting the, the music kind of take the lead on that one. Um, plus we weren't going to do anything with her voice or anything like that. You know, it, it doesn't need to be that way. She's, you know, she is part human. We didn't have to do some sort of like, you know, weird treatment to her voice to kind of second, not just a real voice, but, an, you know, an, artificial voice. I mean, we, we tried it. it. It doesn't work. It wasn't, it wasn't the story. So, um, so no, the music took the lead on that one and did a great job. So Brad, you've had a hell of a year, uh, not only love death and robots, but shadow and bone and also mayor of East town, just to throw something completely stylistically <laughs> different as a show, obviously, a very, very, yeah, very popular, different. big show that you sound supervised. What, what's the, I'm having a hard time putting my finger on what's the, what's the Brad North sound uh, treatment? These things, these shows are all so different. There must've been, a, you must've had a lot of fun this year. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been a pretty good run. Um, well, with Shadow and Bone, I can't, I can't even approach a show like that without Craig. I can't even approach it. You know, that's when, when we do these, some of these crazy shows, especially for Netflix, um, you know, it, uh, it's great to have a partner in Craig. I mean, that's just that, um, you know, as far as like the HBO stuff, um, 
Yeah, it was, that was actually a very different challenge. You know, um, it was, there's nothing huge. There was no crazy sci-fi stuff. It was, it was selling, uh, Philadelphia as a character, you know, that, that was kind of the, the biggest thing. And also trying to clean up those coats. Everyone's got those big puffy coats and they got microphones way tucked in there. So, um, no, what's, what's the style? I, I, I tell you what, I, I, I can't get enough of dynamics. I mean, things can't be big enough or small. And I mean, I, I like playing dynamics. Um, that's if I had a signature thing, I think it would be that I like playing dynamics up, uh, any chance you can hit a cut, any chance you can play something big and then drop off the table that's my type of hype. And, and, uh, you know, when I get to do cool stuff like, uh, you know, like Chatham and bone, I mean, I, not only is Craig a, a, a partner and, a, and, uh, and a coworker, but I'm a huge fan of his just as a sound designer, like interesting sounds are interesting sounds. You don't have to, 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 you know, again, overthink it. It can just be cool just to be cool. There's tons of that stuff in, in Shadow and Bone. Just crazy cool stuff that just sounds cool. You know, it, it doesn't have to do anything. I mean, it's just, sometimes it's just cool stuff is cool stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess it would be trying to find signature sounds and, and uh, dynamics. I, I think that's that's it. And signature sounds can be... You know, like in Shadow and Bone, it can be, you know, the, the shadow powers or the, the, the sun summoner powers, or it can be the backgrounds of a, of a suburb outside of Philadelphia. You know, just have to find that signature sound and, and really work it. Well, guys, uh, I, I don't know how we did this. We somehow we've managed to talk almost 40 minutes about an 18 minute show. So I think that just, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that really, uh, I think kind of speaks to the level of detail and craftsmanship that, uh, that you guys put into this. Congratulations on the incredibly well-deserved Emmy nomination, uh, for love, death and robots. The show was, uh, this, this episode in particular was a lot of fun. Uh, and I think you guys, uh, did just uh, knocked it out of the park with this one. So congrats. Oh, thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. And, and, uh, we always, I always appreciate, I know Brad does too, all the Dolby stuff and all the support you guys give us sound community guys and guys and gals that, uh, you know, are trying to do the best we can do. Many thanks to Brad and Craig for joining us today. I'd also like to thank our friends over at Netflix for putting the conversation together and also for providing us with those cool clips to discuss. You can watch Love, Death and Robots right now on Netflix. The episode that we discussed today, once again, is called Snow in the Desert, but the whole series is super cool. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I encourage you to do so. You can find links to the series via our show notes. And if you haven't already, please make sure you are subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. We have a ton of exciting episodes coming up in the next few weeks that you will not want to miss. You can find links to our dedicated podcast feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please consider leaving us a rating or a review on the Apple Podcasts app. It really helps to raise awareness of our show and helps us continue to grow. Until then, thank you for joining us. This is the Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. Thanks for listening. <laughs>